What is dynamic equilibrium? Well, dynamic equilibrium is a concept that helps us to understand the right amount of drug that needs to be administered in order to reach a therapeutic level in a patient's body, and it takes into consideration all the concepts of pharmacokinetics, how a medication moves through the body. So we are going to look at that and discuss a little bit more about how that impacts us when we provide care right after this. Welcome back, my name is Tammy and this is Nurse Minder and on this channel we do everything nursing. So if you're new here, consider subscribing below so that you get the next video when it's released. Did you know that when you take 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, that your body doesn't actually receive and use 500 milligrams? Well, that's something that we call dynamic equilibrium. Now, the critical concentration of a drug is determined by all the factors we're going to talk to today. And that essentially says, how much drug do I need to cause a therapeutic effect? So I may be taking 500 milligrams of a medication, but I'm not actually utilizing 500 milligrams of a medication. And this, the actual number that a person can use from that dose will depend upon the four factors we're going to talk about next. When it comes to dynamic equilibrium, one of the first things we do is we have to actually take the medication. So it needs to be absorbed. We can put creams on our skin, we can take medications orally, we can insert them into the holes and the orifices of the body. There's also sprays that we can inhale and uh, injections as well. Multiple ways in which we can get medications into the body in order for the body to start to break it down and to absorb it. The root certainly will impact the rate of absorption, but also the patient's conditions that may also be existing in conjunction with the illness or injury that we're, being, that we're treating. So some of the barriers to absorption, many of our drugs that are taken orally, they have been um, studied in healthy individuals, which is an important criteria. So for example, when we take an oral medication, so maybe you've got a headache or you've got some aches and pains and you take an ibuprofen or acetaminophen, we take those pills orally and they go into the stomach. And it's the stomach acid that starts to break down that food and it's needed in order, so stomach acid that starts to break down that medication. But if a patient is missing stomach acid, so for example, maybe they're taking a proton pump inhibitor because they have what's known as GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, or heartburn is what a lot of people call it. Uh, they may be missing that acid, and so then we can supplement that by giving them a couple ounces of Coca-Cola. Take your medications with Coca-Cola if you're on a proton pump inhibitor because it will help to break down that medication. Other times there's medications where you don't want to have an acidic environment and this is where you see instructions such as take with milk or protein and it decreases that acidic environment and it increases the amount of drug that can be broken down. Another barrier might be that the food can bind to that medication blocking its absorption. So for those medications, that's where you're going to see instructions such as take before or after meals or on an empty stomach. So if absorption has to deal with how that medication reaches the circulation and the tissues, distribution is how it moves into the body's tissues, okay? So imagine like an Amazon package has arrived at your door. Maybe it's come by plane, train, foot, bicycle. Somehow it has reach the circulation, reached your front doorstep. And now we need to get it into the door to the person who's actually waiting for that package. So distribution is movement into the body's tissues. One of the biggest things that impacts this is whether the drug is water soluble or lipid soluble. The ionization of it and the tissue perfusion. Okay, so if, if your office happens to be at the very end of the building and nobody ever walks back there, Nobody's going to bring you your package because it's too far to go. So if we have poor tissue perfusion, there's no blood flow to that area, the medication is not going to reach it. So if you have an infection, say um, a classic case is diabetes who have already decreased peripheral circulation as one of their potential complications. 
and now they've got a wound on their toe, well, I may give an antibiotic, but it's not going to reach the site because there's decreased perfusion. There's no traffic heading there. Some drugs require proteins to bind to it. Now, proteins kind of like a transport mechanism. Maybe your Amazon package was too big for someone to carry by itself, so they had to grab a cart to put it on and consider that to be like the protein that binds onto that medication molecule. This becomes a larger transport mechanism and then it's not capable of crossing over that blood brain barrier uh, and nor is it able to enter into the small capillary. So what happens is as it reaches its destination, the molecule, the protein must unbind from that medication, much like I have to take that Amazon package out of my cart to deliver it to you. So uh, medications must be freed from the protein binding at the site of the tissue that it wants to enter. The rate of release from this protein um, is part of what gives us our slow acting and long acting information about medication. So if it's released in a very slow fashion, it's considered a long acting. And if it's released quickly, um, you know, drive by, poof, out you go, considered fast acting. Lipid solubility, as I mentioned, is are the types of drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier. If it's water-soluble, it cannot cross that blood-brain barrier. So lipid solubility is a critical factor in order to get medications into the brain if that's where you have infection or swelling or disease process. Uh, medications do readily cross over the placenta and into the breast milk, so that is not an issue here so much with distribution in terms of being protein-bound or lipid-soluble. They cross over quite naturally. So the third element of dynamic equilibrium is metabolism. So this is where the body takes those foreign chemicals and breaks them down into active and inactive forms. The inactive forms will be excreted and the active forms will further their journey to their site of or their target tissues to have an effect. The liver is one of the major organs in which medications are metabolized and broken down. So what happens when we take oral medications in particular, we have this thing called first pass effect. So if you recall from your circulatory system, when electrolytes, fluid, and everything is, is absorbed from the small intestine, it enters into that portal circulation. So what that means is when I take an oral medication, remember it goes into the stomach, the acid starts to break it down, but most, like about 60% of our drugs are absorbed in the small intestine. So they're drawn out of the lumen of the intestine into the circulation system. They enter into that portal vein system, which feeds the liver first. So what happens when it gets to the liver is called first pass effect. The medication reaches the liver, the liver transforms it active, inactive. The inactive is destroyed and excreted and the activated form, which actually happens to require an enzyme called P450, then breaks it down and sends it to the target tissue site to have its desired effect. So again, going back to that acetaminophen, my headache goes away. What's really interesting to note here is that the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, actually once it's activated, can speed up the metabolism of other medications. So this is where some of our information comes from in terms of do not give this medication with X, Y, and Z because we may end up having either toxic levels or subtoxic levels, subtherapeutic levels of medications when they're given jointly. Now because the liver is an important organ in terms of metabolism, it is a significant, you need to know the status of your patient's liver functioning in order to determine whether or not the dosage of the medication needs to be increased or decreased. Similarly, when it comes to excretion, if our kidneys aren't working, we can have a toxic buildup of medications and that's related to the half-life and we'll talk about that in one second. So excretion, we get rid of our medications predominantly through the urine, but there are other places in which we can uh, release toxins from the body. So for example, saliva, um, our breathing, our lungs, in our feces and our bile, those are also places where the body will excrete medications that are not active or needed in the body. This takes us to the concept of half-life. Half-life is the time it takes to the amount of drug to go from one concentration to half of that concentration and subsequently each time it goes down further. So as an example, if I take 
500 milligrams of medication at 8 o'clock and it has a half-life of two hours, then by 10 o'clock it would go down to 250 milligrams available. In another two hours, we're looking at the time it takes for 250 to reduce to half. So by 12 o'clock, that would reduce to 125. In another two hours, 125 becomes 67.5 milligrams, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can see that a 500 milligram dose with a half-life of two hours, there is still medication in the system at midnight of that same day. But it's not a therapeutic level. So what we tend to do is four half-lives. We used four half-lives as, half as a general rule for the next subsequent dose. So if this was a medication that had a two-hour half-life, I would give it at eight o'clock. And four half-lives later, at two o'clock, I would schedule it again. And then again, four hours later, I would schedule another dose. And that's to make sure that the body always maintains a therapeutic level. The time to clear a drug from the body is very different than the time and scheduling of frequency of medication admin. Of course, there are several human factors that can also affect dynamic equilibrium. We're going to burn through a few of those now just to give you a sense of how complicated medication admin can be for your patient to make sure they're getting the desired effect we want, so desperately want. Wait, we know that most drugs dosing is based on a healthy 150 pound person, so that means someone who is more than or less than will require an adjustment in their medications. We know that age will impact because we have pediatric doses, geriatric doses, the gender, men have more muscle, and so that if we give an injection, it's more rapidly absorbed. Women have more fat. Gosh, I wish that wasn't true, but it is. Women have more fat, so that can slow absorption. Physiological factors such as your hydration status, your electrolyte acid base balance, will influence how that medication interacts in the body. Pathological meaning are disease processes, so if I have liver or kidney disease, what is that doing to my metabolism, my excretion? If I'm taking that proton pump inhibitor, how is that impacting absorption? Psychological, we certainly have heard of the placebo effect where there is no maybe evidence that the medication works as the person is experiencing it. So there is some psychological element to the human factors of MedAdmin. Genetics, we know that not everyone responds the same. Immunological, why do some people have allergies and others don't? Why do some people seroconvert with their hepatitis immunization and why do others not? Environment, this is a really common one for our, um, our patients who go south for the winter, that they will find that they need to have their medication just, medications adjusted for the different temperatures. Interactions, what else are they taking? Is this food, grapefruit juice is one of them? Is this a, a herbal remedy over the counter, natural remedy like ginkgo biloba? Those are things that will interact with medications. Patients tolerance to that medication as well. So as you can see, there's a several human factors that also impact dynamic equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium. Wow, what a massive topic and a lot of things to consider when we give our medications patients. So it's not as simple as matching the medication to the package that you have. It's about looking at your patient in totality. So in this video, we have covered a lot of information, valuable information. We have looked at pharmacokinetics specifically and the concept of dynamic equilibrium when we're looking at absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of medications throughout the body. In addition, we've looked at several elements of each unique individual that you're caring for that might influence that critical concentration and the therapeutic effect of the medication you so wish to have. Until next time, make it a great day.